Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, being a part of this uh, this panel. This is my disclosure slide, none of which relates to this talk. So um, uh, I would uh, just uh, echo a lot of the things that uh, Brian Jacob has just said. Um, this is a condition I got involved in uh, seeing athletes for almost 25 years ago, and I really knew very little about this uh, problem uh, back then, and so I really had to educate myself about some of these other conditions because the diagnosis is one of the first keys to having a successful outcome. And so you have to learn a little bit about you know, injuries around the pelvis, the various muscular strains, hip injuries, as Brian has talked about, and we're going to focus on the sports hernia pubalgia problem, and there, um, you know, of course, uh, inguinal hernia and non-athletic causes that can occur as well. So in general, the indications for surgery are symptoms that limit athletic performance, failure of a period of time of conservative therapy, usually six to eight weeks, and supportive exam and imaging findings. Uh, I, I will say that I agree with Brian. If you have a, an acute injury and an imageable tear at that rectus abdominal insertion, then typically we'll pull the trigger on uh, repairing those early on. But most of the ones that I see are uh, the more chronic injuries. There are a number of different approaches, as he's just said, any of which can be uh, um, linked with an adductor tenotomy, and we can maybe talk about that in the discussion. So if you look at the various series that are out there, everybody reports great results. Um, there's not real good data on timing of return to play. Uh, Follow-up intervals are variable. There's no direct comparative studies whatsoever of the various techniques, and there's a lot of variability in the use of and techniques for doing adductor tenotomy. There is one open clinical trial. It's in um, uh, Europe, in Scandinavia, and it's looking at uh, TEP repair versus the open minimal suture repair technique. Um, and these are the endpoints that are shown here, and so it's going to take a while probably for the, us to get the results of that study. So let, let's dive in just a little bit more into the, the mechanisms before I start talking about the, the, the injury. This is a sagittal view on the MRI, and here you can see the rectus, uh, the pubis, and then this bright signal here is the area of the tear that you see. That, that's seen in a percentage of patients. The other thing that's very, very consistent in this, our surgical exploration is a weakened posterior floor, and here's shown from the anterior and then posteriorly from the laparoscopic review. And, and, and one of the things that we, reasons that we think that people have this pain is because of this imbalance in forces across the pubis. They're, they're weak on the abdominal side, they're tight on the adductor side, and that creates stress across the pubis, and that's the source of a lot of their pain. Um, there have been people who talked about inguinal and genital neuropathy. I don't think that's a consistent issue. It can be in some cases. So my preferred approach is an open anterior mesh repair um, using a lightweight polypropylene mesh. Um, it's very analogous to the Lixenstein repair. I do a couple of little extra things. I typically do these under local anesthesia with sedation, and we're highly selective about whether we would do any kind of neurectomy or not. This is just a study from Dave uh, uh, Ray Brown and Dave Mulder's uh, experience in the National Hockey League looking at uh, mesh repair in professional hockey players. They all had Gore-Tex mesh uh, and ilioingual nerve resections, and um, they had a very high success rate in terms of the outcome. They have a little bit of a different approach in that they reinforce the external oblique preferentially as opposed to the posterior inguinal floor. I just thought I would show you some operative findings. This is very consistent in my experience. They almost all will have this attenuation in the external oblique aponeurosis, as you can see in the image on the right. And then if I can just play this uh, video, this is a recent case I did, an open repair. And um, I don't think the video is working. Can you please play the video? I can't tell if it's uh, playing or not. But what you can see with respiration is there's a little bit of movement or bulging uh, in that uh, posterior inguinal floor. All right. Okay. Let's go to the. There it is. Yeah. Can you see? You can see a little bit of movement in that posterior inguinal floor. It's just very weak and tenuous to tissue, and so I think there's a certainly a chronic wear and tear component that leads to this deterioration in the posterior inguinal floor. The other thing, and this is the reason why I uh, typically use a mesh repair, is because there's tension uh, between the good tissue and the inguinal ligament. So you can see that's the uh, transversalis aponeurosis rectus sheath, and if you try to pull that all the way over to the inguinal ligament, there's a lot of tension on that. And just about everything else we do in surgery, tension is a bad thing, and so that's why I preferentially will use a tension-free mesh repair for doing these. And then this just shows uh, the sutures that are placed in that healthy tissue along that uh, medial border uh, of the um, inguinal floor. 
along the transversalis uh, aponeurosis. And then um, this is the, uh, it's a little hard to show in an open case really how well the mesh sits in there, but it's important that it be nice and flat um, and because uh, uh, you don't want any folds at all because these, at, these are individuals that are going to be returning to high level activity. So I'll just share a little bit uh, my experience. Uh, almost 300 athletes uh, over a 16 year period. They tend to be young. They're the vast majority are male or there are a few women. And the mean duration of symptoms uh, between the time of onset and referral has averaged about nine months. Most of these end up getting repaired in the off season from their sport. Uh, about two thirds are professional and collegiate athletes, but I see a number of high school athletes and increasingly uh, recreational athletes, which represents about 25% of my experience. Now we've. Uh, carried out a consecutive prospective case series looking at uh, patients who failed conservative therapy and underwent this approach using a standardized post-operative rehab protocol. Uh, we started this um, uh, standardized pain surveys beginning in uh, 2012 and measured their level of uh, play, both their level of play, self-reported, and level of growing pain at rest. The distribution of injuries is shown here. There's about half between the right and the left. 17% were bilateral. A lot of them had associated adductor symptoms. Uh, if that is the predominant part of their symptomatology and they have associated findings of tightness and tension in that adductor component um, and potentially supportive imaging findings, then we'll often do a uh, limited adductor tenotomy. And um, there were a number of these that had a delayed presentation on the contralateral side. So the vast majority of these underwent an open uh, tension-free mesh repair. I did do a few primary repairs, primarily in young athletes who are still growing. Um, in most cases, it was a repair of their floor only. There were about a third. They got a floor repair plus adductor, and I've had a few individuals that we've done partial adductor releases and on who only had adductor symptoms and findings and no findings or pain whatsoever up on the uh, abdominal wall side. And this graph just illustrates what their level of uh, play and groin pain uh, uh, was. So at uh, three months, 12 months, a very little uh, pain in, in the groin and level of play was at 90% by three months and, and higher than that uh, at uh, 12 months post-op. And over 90% had returned to sport at 12 months. We have a mean follow-up at 13 months. Uh, there have been some that have undergone reoperation, and most of these were relatively early in, in my experience and subsequently underwent uh, adductor uh, procedures elsewhere. I've had two patients I've had to do, redo adductor releases because of scar tissue that developed in the uh, groin. A fair, very small number who underwent uh, abdominal reoperation, and then uh, a number, some of these may have associated hip problems that require uh, subsequent uh, surgery. I think one of the important aspects of this is, um, as Brian alluded to, you really have to have um, a good uh, physical therapy, athletic therapist, uh, guru that you can send these patients to afterwards. And so with Ray Borelli as the head athletic trainer of the St. Louis Blues, put this uh, rehab protocol together uh, with me. And uh, this is what we give to all our athletes that go back and work with their uh, trainers. And it's a, uh, it's a stepwise progression and return to activity based on uh, their symptomatology. And I think this is really an essential compo um, component of their uh, post-operative rehab, and they should be on some type of maintenance program as they uh, return to their subsequent uh, season. Uh, there is a book uh, that we have out on this that was done in conjunction with Dave Didick, who's head of sports uh, medicine and orthopedics at the University of Virginia. Covers all of the different surgical approaches and talks about imaging and diagnosis and that sort of thing. And so if, uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, I would encourage you to go to Springer and uh, take a look at this. And with that, I will conclude. I appreciate being a part of this section and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.